Welcome to Smarter Athletes Periodization 101, or better understood as time management for athletes. I've taken the liberty of crossing out the word periodization there and uh, simply put time management for athletes uh, for the intents and purposes of our presentation today. That's how we're going to understand periodization um, most simply as a time management strategies for athletes. And uh, hopefully over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, you'll, you'll come to understand why it's, it's better known as time management. Um, so what we're talking about today is time management over the long term. All right? So periodization does uh, kind of refer to the way we differentiate our training over uh, the course of, uh, of maybe a six-month period, a 12-month period, a two-year period. But uh, we're kind of breaking our, our training year or six month or two year term down into these kind of sub terms and, and really kind of focusing on specific purposes for each of those sub terms and, and really kind of trying to reach um, this kind of prepared premeditated point in, in that, that training year or two year block where we are at a, a peak state of performance. And, and that's all really kind of dependent on um, managing these relationships between the focus of the training block and the volume and the intensity of the training over that duration. Um, but we do want those periods of peak fitness to kind of coincide with things like priority competition and, and uh, priorities of, of like in-season competition. And, and, um, and, and really the, what that really amounts to is is, is peak fitness. We're, we're looking to kind of achieve peak fitness um, in, in a state where we need it most or a time when we need it most. So athletes who understand the proper way to structure a periodized training model benefit in, in uh, several ways. First, achieving uh, a well-timed strategic state of peak fitness. Um, secondly, making sure that they're kind of continuously improving over that training year or training block. Um, and lastly, making sure that they're mitigating risk of injury and, and keeping those chances of becoming injured or burnt out or, or demotivated, keeping those things low um, by, by properly integrating recovery into that, that periodized cycle as well. All right, so let's go through uh, basic theory of periodization. Let's talk about the different cycles and sub-cycles of periodization. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the relationships between volume and intensity, and then uh, we'll get down to a, a few examples as well that exist here at the school. Um, I'll give you some real examples of athletes that I have worked with, and uh, we can go from there. Hopefully, uh, in this class, you will all have the chance to kind of understand periodization as it works best for you and design with me your own uh, periodization models for, for an annual plan or a semi-annual plan, whatever that might look like, depending on your sport uh, focus and uh, your priority competition seasons. So starting with basic theory, um, periodization also involves general adaptation syndrome, which we have talked about before. I think you guys probably remember this now. Alarm phase, resistance phase, and always that potential for exhaustion phase. We won't spend much time talking about it today. Hopefully your recall of this is pretty good. Remembering that we do require an alarm phase for this bounce back of resistance phase. For us to come back stronger, we need to actually put our bodies in that little bit of shock. So in periodization theory, coaches and trainers use models in conjunction with assessments of their athletes' abilities, potential, and current state of fitness and skill, and their competition calendar, and of course, their goals. That kind of goes without saying. So from a strength and conditioning standpoint, my job, periodization is really individualized based on the strengths and weaknesses of an athlete, what I see in the weight room, in the training environment, and also the feedback that I get from their sport-specific coaches. So when it comes to periodizing a schedule for an athlete in a school like Bill Crothers, it's almost crucial that I'm in communication with the coaches and trainers of that athlete outside of the school in order to do this right and not run the risk of wasting any time or being too redundant with the prescription of training. So when we look at a training year, um, we can see that a periodized training year is kind of broken down into to these different little blocks, all right? So the, the gray line on top of the training year is, is preceded or subseded by these mesocycles beneath, beneath it. And each of those mesocycles serves a different purpose, right? Whether it's preparation, competition, or transition back to, to the next year. Um, and in those mesocycles, we have these general preparation and specific preparation cycles, a pre-competition cycle and a competition cycle, and then a transition cycle, which is generally spoken of as kind of the off-season. 
All right, inside of general preparation, there's even, even further subdivisions, a preparation phase and a base phase. Inside of specific preparation, we see what's called a build phase, and that's the, the fitness building up toward the peak season or the pre-competition season where we're hoping to be in peak shape that we can hold through a race season in this case or if it's a you know a competition season in a in a for a basketball athlete or a soccer athlete we wouldn't see the word race there but we would see the same concept this hopefully 10 15 12 weeks season where competition is at its highest followed by transition which is generally speaking a, a bit of a, a layoff um, not just an off season but but um, uh, a, a a kind of finale to the to the competition season that allows the athlete some downtime to rest and recover. Periodization theory also kind of shows us there's, there's this kind of inverse relationship between volume and intensity that exists over the course of the macro cycle, so the single year or, or whatever the, the periodization cycle is. And, and the way we look at this inverse relationship is pretty simple. Um, our volume line kind of starts to descend as our intensity line increases over the course of the year. But we also notice these little wave patterns in the intensity line constantly throughout. And uh, if, if we go back and reflect upon our general adaptation syndrome, um, it's pretty easy to understand why that wave pattern exists. Um, especially during that resistance phase, during the, the point where we want our bodies to recover, um, it's in our best interest to kind of bring our intensity down so that our body does have that optimal opportunity to bounce back properly. So basic theory definitely contends that using these kind of inverse relationships allows us the best opportunity to kind of recover properly and benefit from the training stimulus that we would have created. Um, and eventually, yeah, reach that peak state of performance. Uh, conventional models also kind of emphasize that we focus on things like training our technique a little bit more and taking some of the volume or the sheer just, you know, mileage or whatever you want to call it out of our training programs as we approach that peak point of the season. So here's a traditional model. It just kind of shows that same inverse relationship between volume and intensity and this kind of increasing focus on the technical side of sport as the season continues toward competition and transition away from competition even. Um, technique being probably more typically non-fatiguing drills and skills that uh, an athlete might benefit from when, when uh, he or she isn't as physically exhausted from a high volume of training. So you can kind of see how this relationship makes sense from a balance standpoint. So let's look at cycles individually now. Going back to our, our training year and understanding what a macro cycle is, we know that that's the, the grandest version of the periodization plan. So whether we're periodizing over six months or a full calendar year or maybe even a two or four year period, the macro cycle is the big picture. Below that, we have the mesocycles, and every single mesocycle needs to serve a specific purpose. It needs to be declared by its purpose. So in this case, there's the preparation, the competition, and the transition mesocycles that have sub-mesocycles known as general preparation and specific preparation, or pre-competition and competition. So those sub-mesocycles as well are, are kind of declarations within the mesocycle, making sure that the athlete knows the purpose and the coach knows the clear set purpose of each term or each block of training. And of course below that we have our microcycles. And in this case, one microcycle is represented by one week. So over the course of a training year, we see 52 microcycles. It's pretty typical for an athlete to use a seven day or one week microcycle, especially if that athlete has a consideration that they need to pay special attention to, like a job or being a student. Um, sometimes we do see microcycles of an odd number of days, like 10 days or or 20-day microcycles or 5-day microcycles, microcycles that don't typically coincide with the days of a week simply because they're professional athletes. It doesn't really matter to them which day it is. They just kind of train on this 5-day or 10-day cycle. Uh, but more often than not, we do see 7 and sometimes 14-day microcycles because those, those cycles will coincide with a particular day of the week and keep things uh, pretty routine for the athlete. So the macro cycle, it's the biggest cycle in the periodization plan. Um, we did talk about athletes who might be periodization over a longer than one full year. Um, and those would be people like Olympic athletes, for example, or people that were targeting a world championships event that was uh, 
uh, happening every two years or every three years and not uh, not every single year. Um, but more often than not, a macro cycle is a one-year cycle for athletes who are seasonal and always gearing up toward a similar competition season. When we look at a traditional linear model, this is something that's over four years here, and this is an athlete's four-year plan. Um, but we're, even though it's a four-year model, we can see an athlete kind of reaching a peak state of fitness around the same time each calendar year. That's one year within the four-year model, and it's no different from any of the other four. This is a linear periodization model, and then it follows the same succession of events over the course of the four-year period. When we talk about mesocycles, these are the specific phases within a macrocycle. There's a certain focus for every mesocycle. Every mesocycle needs to be met with a training target. A macro cycle is usually broken down to four or five of these depending on the athlete, and depending on the season, and depending on how many areas of focus that athlete really has. It wouldn't be very common for an athlete to designate more than five mesocycles over the course of a training year. That's probably too many focuses and an athlete's probably better suited to kind of break that into a two-year program and focus on more base elements in the first year and fine-tune in the second year. It's a good example here of a preseason build mesocycle for a specific conditioning targets that might include things like introducing high speed movement or relying on off season strength gains to increase specific speed drills. And these are the kinds of things that we might want to set out on paper before we design a mesocycle for ourselves. Every mesocycle definitely should have clearly defined skill and conditioning targets for it. And the athlete's never losing track of those. Also, over the course of a mesocycle, a series of fitness tests or assessments should be implemented to make sure the focus or purpose of that mesocycle aligns with what's going on. If the goals and assessments aren't being improved upon, or knowing that that mesocycle's purpose is either irrelevant or not necessarily holding true for the athlete, or that the program design needs to change. When we look at a more complex periodization model, it's often aligned with something called a YTP or yearly training plan. So here's an example of a yearly training plan. And a yearly training plan that takes into account volume and intensity considerations and specific competition dates is probably the best way to do this. I often work with coaches of individual sport athletes here at the school that provide me with these yearly training plans and my role is to kind of offset this yearly training plan with appropriate condition at the, uh, conditioning and strength work at the appropriate times. And it's not always an easy task. In some cases, athletes are so busy that trying to fit the right amount of training into certain blocks that doesn't overlap with uh, mental stresses like um, student exam periods and holidays can be quite challenging. Here's an off-season volume periodization grid that's been built for one of our long-distance runners here at the school. This is a pretty simple distribution of volume over the course of a 20-week cycle. And as you can see here, this total weekly volume dips down every four weeks for this particular athlete. The reason for the drop is the same reason we talked about in our general adaptation syndrome, to allow the body to accommodate the alarm phase and to bounce back stronger. When we talk about microcycles and periodization, remember that we're talking usually about weeks. So a microcycle that's often 7 or 14 days is done so to align with the days of the week. Definitely, a microcycle could be something like a 10-day rotation, and that would be more often reserved for a high-performance athlete who really only has one job, which is to train, and the day of the week doesn't necessarily carry any weight for that particular athlete. Any well-planned microcycle should also involve specific details for training. So while the goal over the course of several microcycles in a row might remain the same, since they're all part of the same macrocycle or mesocycle, sorry, um, the individual training details for each session should probably be laid out ahead of time. This is to prevent an athlete from wandering into a training environment meaninglessly and not having a deliberate practice session. This is an example of a microcycle detail for weeks one through four in the same athlete that was just shown previously. 
These are his run schedules, and there are details for each individual run, as you can see here. So microcycles one through four are provided in detail. That's one microcycle right there. There are different types of periodization models, and this is where we'll talk about linear versus nonlinear models. While the linear periodization model is usually reserved for the athlete who has a similar competition season year after year after year, and that same competition season aligns with that of his teammates and opponents, a linear model makes the most sense. We can definitely suggest a certain time in the year where we would ideally be at a state of peak fitness. And we can also suggest a certain time in the year where we would be at a state ideal for recovery or transition into an off season. So using a linear model allows athletes who train and compete with the same structure end over end or year over year to build into this kind of routine that allows them to arrive at peak competition around the same time every year. So hopefully you can think of some of the athletes who would obviously use a linear model. It's not too hard to do. In the professional world, these would be any, any NBA players or NHL players, anybody that basically has a truly clearly defined season and a goal time where they would like to be in a state of peak fitness. Going back to our linear periodization model, it's not to say an athlete doesn't improve year over year over year. Of course they do and they hope to, but the trend stays the same each year. A nonlinear model is designed to adapt a microcycle to or macrocycle, sorry, to the demands of peak performance in time. This would be examples of athletes who basically compete for themselves or compete fairly irregularly over the course of a calendar year. Some athletes, especially individual athletes, might find themselves competing in championship events at opposite ends of the calendar year with four to five months of, of time in between. And while both of those competition dates are extremely important for them, these athletes can't possibly expect to be in a state of peak fitness between the two for the entire duration of the time. So these athletes need to be able to do two things. They need to be able to reach multiple peaks over the course of the calendar year, and they also need to be able to adapt or change their training schedules and annual plans on the fly. They need to be a little bit more adaptable because their training schedules and competition schedules are a little bit less predictable. So nonlinear models are used for those athletes, usually again individual sport athletes who might have several important competitions spread out evenly over the course of the calendar year and they need to fit in all sorts of different types of training in between those calendar dates. For example, we might be looking at fighters, other individual sport athletes like tennis players who compete in tournaments all over the world at different times of the year, um, or indoor slash outdoor athletes who compete on teams um, that seem to travel and play in multiple tournaments over a 12-month cycle. A nonlinear periodization model doesn't necessarily carry the same flow or show this inverse relationship between volume and intensity that was shown in a linear model. Rest assured, there still is an inverse relationship between volume and intensity. It's just not as clearly defined. And since the model is nonlinear, that relationship flips back and forth more frequently over the course of a 12-month period. So when discussing these volume and intensity relationships, we have to always understand that there will always be an inverse relationship regardless of whether or not it's a linear or nonlinear model. Sometimes those relationships are a little bit more difficult to recognize and they switch more frequently in the nonlinear model as we've just seen. So training volume can remain relatively constant if we, continue, if we consider volume a little bit differently. So as opposed to thinking about volume as hours in a certain condition of training, let's think about the concept of time management once again, and volume as something like how many hours we commit to the discipline 
of the sport that we train in. So if we step away from thinking about volume, for example, as this number of hours that we sweat each week, and we start thinking about volume as this number of hours that we can commit to becoming a better athlete each week, we can actually maintain this relatively steady amount of volume over the course of a training year. So you'll notice in this particular training model that across the entire grid, off-season, early pre-season, pre-season, and in-season, the training volume holds the same. It's really only that post-season transition, uh, relaxing time period for the athlete that the total weekly training hours is, is any different. Um, and it's just the distribution of training volume or training hours between non-fatiguing skills training and uh, other forms of aerobic systems or fatiguing skills training that actually create the variability. Um, so it is entirely possible for volume by its simple definition of the amount of time you spend committed to the sport or discipline um, to remain the same. Um, uh, as opposed to viewing volume or observing volume as you know, simply the number of hours that we are working hard and having an elevated heart rate and you know, putting in sweat equity uh, with respect to training. So I would certainly encourage you to kind of view volume in that light um, and thinking about time management and the balanced training load because the reality for the student athlete is this. Um, the number of hours that you can commit to this sport is, is generally going to be the same since your lifestyle as a student is generally going to have the same uh, amount of demand on, on, you, on you elsewhere. So making good use of that time as a student athlete is probably one of the best ways to kind of ensure that you're not being burnt out and that you're not doing too much and also that you're kind of maintaining a pretty consistent weekly commitment to the sport. Um, and, and distributing your time just a little bit differently over the course of that training year based on your periodization mesocycles. So that's the end of our presentation on periodization. Thanks very much.